Okay, so good morning and welcome. Today we're going to talk about the face of God. And we've already talked about hiding the face, where God hides his face, and I have the link here for that. Um, but I found verses that seem related and some added thoughts and questions about the face of God. So we're going to do a group study here to explore that topic. And both the video of this session and the right, written study, once it's edited from my notes in this file, will be posted on uh, the website there. So let's go ahead, and Dorothy would be first to read Exodus 33, 20, right at the top of the page there, Dorothy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. I wonder why that is. Well, yeah, a lot of people wonder. It's a good question. So face to face with God, is that a good position to be in? This verse says, no one may see me and live, kind of suggesting a danger to anyone who sees God, isn't it? Yeah. Like if you saw him, you'd drop dead or something. That's, <laughs> we'll say right away, that's not the true meaning, but we'll sort that out. It sounds kind of like a variation of the idiom, maybe you've heard this, if I have, if I tell you, I'll have to kill you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> meaning yeah. something, meaning like if something is so secret, it cannot be revealed. Or if you somehow learn the secret, you would have to die to prevent it from spreading further. That's kind of what that means. So does it mean that God would kill anyone who saw his face? That's not what it says. <laughs> it doesn't say he would kill you. No, it doesn't. Okay. So let's... That, that, first... I've heard that it, you know, that it... What it means is that sin and God cannot be in the same place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So have you heard that or do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I've heard that, you know, sin can't exist in God's presence, that kind of idea, which I think is what you're saying. So if a yeah. sinner who obviously has sin isn't God God's presence, what happens? That's why no man yeah. can see me and yeah, because everybody's a sinner, right? Okay. Let's read these verses that kind of throw a question into that. Um Exodus thirty three eleven, Evans. And the Lord speak unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servants, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, but that's not out of the tabernacle. Okay, so in this verse, Moses spoke face to face with God. He didn't die. Yeah, he didn't die. So are they talking about Jesus or God the Father here? Well, um, it's almost a case I would say of take your pick because what I say isn't the final word. And we understand that it was the Son of God who led Israel in the wilderness. But many people read it as the Father in the Old Testament. I don't think that's the case, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a contradiction. It says he spoke to him face to face as a man speaks to his friend. But then you go to verse 20 and God says, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. Yeah. It's a bit. It's, it's a bit. It's Are a bit, they maybe thinking of his character? Like yeah, that, you can see. We'll see that that comes into it. Yeah. yeah. His character and our perception of it is a big part of it. But we'll see that as we go through, which is the whole purpose of doing this. Okay, so let's go to Matthew 17, 3, Judy. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Okay, so they would have seen each other face to face. That is, Moses and Elijah would have seen Jesus face to face, right, talking to him, right? So maybe in this case, in the Old Testament, maybe this is the Father. Oh, oh. Okay. okay. I'm not no. saying it is. I'm just. Or maybe that's Jesus you're saying, not the Father. Well, it's Jesus in the case of Matthew, right? For yeah, sure. but in Exodus 33:11, you said maybe it's the Father, but maybe it's maybe it's Yeshua, maybe it's Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Genesis 32:30, Paul. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Okay, so here's one that 
uh, Jacob said he saw God face to face and he's still alive. That seems like another contradiction to Exodus 33.20. But here's more, more about what happened with Moses. Um, Exodus 33.18-23. Trish. And he said, I beseech thee, shew me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will shew mercy on whom I will shew mercy. And he said, Thou canst see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory paths passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with mine hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Okay, thank you. So when he says, uh, cover thee with my hand, that kind of suggests protection. God's protection. Mm -hmm. that way. And face and back can be understood to signify degrees of glory, okay? God was allowing Moses to perceive God's glory or character, but only to a certain degree, okay? And I've got the link here for our study of the word glory. It may have nothing to do with literal back parts of God, okay? It's just a matter of if you, like if you wanted to get to know someone, um, if you could see their face, you'd learn about them a lot more. You can see their expressions and everything and recognize their facial features. If you just, for some reason, you're introduced to someone, but they're standing with their back to you, you're not going to get to know them as much. Okay. The Hebrew word for face in the Old Testament is often translated presence. When we seek the face of God, we are seeking his presence. The call to seek God's face was issued to his people because they had abandoned him and needed to return to him. Okay, there was many calls for them to seek his presence, to return to him. So to seek God's face is to seek his presence, his favor, his blessing, or even an understanding of his character. And we have a couple of verses here. Um, Daniel 9, 3, Dorothy. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Okay. Do you think he was seeking to understand God better? What was he seeking? He was seeking by prayer and supplications, but what was he seeking for? He was in Daniel 9, wasn't he trying to understand the prophecy of the 70 weeks? Or I think it was the seven. No, the seventy years that they had. It was coming to the end of the seventy years of captivity, and he wanted to know more about what was going to happen. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he was always wanting to know God better. But yes, specifically in this case, he was reading the prophecies of Jeremiah, right. and there were some parts he just wasn't understanding there. So that's what he was. He was seeking. Seeking knowledge yeah, from was, God. Yeah, seeking knowledge from God about the Word of God. So. And then uh, Hosea 5.15, Evans. I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge down of events and they seek my face. And if there are friction, they will seek me, Aria. Okay. Um, so he's waiting for them to seek his face, maybe to turn from their idols and pay attention to him instead. So to seek him with prayer and supplications, with repentance and early, or as a matter of priority. I think those are things pointed out by those verses there. And this seeking God is not speaking primarily about physical proximity. Uh, we expect to wait till, till heaven for that. Um, but God is always at least potentially near us. Okay, James 4, 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then uh, Psalm 145, 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, 
to all who call upon him in truth. Okay. And then Isaiah 55, 6, Trish. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jeremiah 29, 13, Dorothy. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall seek for me with all your heart. Okay. Um, again, this is not about like the seek me and find me is not about looking to be in God's presence, is it? Not physically, but spiritually. Spiritually. So could to see his face refer to understanding his character then? And to seek a close relationship too. Sure, and a close, close relationship with anyone is based on a knowledge of their character. So let's consider more. What does you can't see my face and live mean? So we're going to kind of, it'll seem like a sidetrack, but we're going to look at something similar to help us understand it. So Genesis 2.17, Evans. But of the tree of knowledge and of good evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, Thereof thou shalt sorry die. Okay. Who who was being warned about what in that verse? Let's just think about it. Adam and Eve were being warned not to eat of the tree of knowledge. Okay. Sounds pretty plain, doesn't it? Um, told them what to do or not do and what the result would be. Yeah. And um, told them they could eat any other of any other tree. It's not that particular one. And we would assume, you know, he spoke in a language they could understand totally. There wouldn't be a problem there. So how would they understand that? Don't do it. Don't eat from that tree. Okay. Um, or what? I mean, the consequences there too. How would they understand the consequence if they did eat of it? They'd die. Okay. They'd probably pique their curiosity. Yeah, I guess it's being human. Yeah, and, yeah, and, that's true. and they probably want to know what's die. I mean, they've just been created, right? Yeah. And they wouldn't know what death was. So they might understand it that they would die from the fruit they ate that day. Okay, that would be a warning, wouldn't it? A warning of a natural poison. Or they might understand that God would kill them for eating it that day. And that would be a threat of imposed punishment. I understand the warning and threat, like a warning is telling you of danger from someone else, and a threat is telling you of danger from me. I mean, okay, that's kind of the difference. Mm. So they would surely die. In the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. So they would either die from the fruit, or they would die from God killing them, because that's he spoke to them about it. Um, they obviously didn't die from the fruit. You know, there's no, they didn't drop dead the moment they ate it. So they might suspect that God would kill them for eating it that day. And of course, that would be the logical reason why they would have hid when God came to meet with them later in the day. But neither of those happened. Okay. And apparently, where it says, um, thou shalt surely die. A more literal, literal translation would be dying thou shalt die. In other words, it's a, a process. You would start to die. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the process would begin resulting in their death at some time in the future. And it's interesting, actually, that uh, I didn't put this in here, but um, I understand Eve died before Adam, and Adam died, I forget the number, but 970 maybe years of age so he died within the thousand years of his uh, creation okay and we know that the verse in peter and other places it talks about a day with the lord is as a thousand years mm -hmm. so there might be something there um 930 years 930 years um, dying yeah. okay it's obviously you know he so in that sense he did die the same day we could say um, but it was a slow process. 
So he started to die. He no longer had eternal life. He didn't have that potential. And he just gradually got older as we all do. This was a slower process for him. I guess we've got many more inherited um, problems there. So we can't live for 900 plus years. No, not uh, in our present state, no. No. Okay, so we're going to look at some other verses that also describe long-term processes. 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay. So the idea is that as we behold the glory or character of God, we're changed into the same image. So is that saying that should I see or suddenly comprehend the entire glory of God that I would be changed into his image that same day, let's say? Do you think that's what it's saying? No. We are being transformed into the same image. It's a process. It's a process. Okay. <laughs> Does yours actually say that? Being transformed. Oh, okay. That, that's better. Because our change doesn't, in the King James, our change doesn't say anything about the length of time. But no. being, being changed? Being transformed is, yeah. is into the same image. Yes, could sound like a more gradual process. Mm -hmm. And it is, that's the point. It's a process over time. As we continue beholding the character of God, it works a gradual change in us. Okay? Because we have to take in that information, and it has to change even neural connections in our brain. It is a process. Um, I put a link in here for a page on the website uh, about cleansing by the word. Okay, and there it describes how studying the word of God will gradually change us. Okay. So let's go to Ephesians 5.26, Paul. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, and of her is the church. The church, okay. Um, again, that cleansing is going to be a process, right? It's not instantaneous. Okay, also Ezekiel 36, 26, Trish. A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Okay, yeah, okay. So how does God do that? Is it like a heart transplant? You get put out on the operating table and wake up with a new heart? Is it like that? Does it by the spirit? Does it by the spirit? Yeah. Personality. Personality, okay. And is that personality change or whatever we want to call it, a gradual process? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not instantaneous, is it? Judging by your, you know, my own road to the God. <laughs> right. Our, in our own experiences, we can see that. It, it, it's a gradual change. I mean, I first got interested in these spiritual things in about 1980, I guess. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and I have to give others grace because I recognize that in me it was a long process to gradually come to know God better. So the mind changes only gradually. And maybe you can think of others, and if you do, I'd like to know, other examples of where things that could be read as a very quick process actually are a process taking time, a gradual change. So we're talking long-term focus rather than an instant result. So going back to this, um, you can't see my face and live. If it was a similar long-term process being described, what would that mean? And how would that work? If what was a similar long-term process? There can no man see me and live. Maybe it means that you can gradually see more and more of him. Okay. Okay. Good thought. So I put some possibilities here. I put, uh, did, it does not mean that no man ever um, saw him and, and didn't live. 
because there are examples of seeing God and living. And we'll look at some of those. Also, I put down, it was a reference to the Father and not the Son of God. Okay, like who is speaking here? And because many uh, people saw the Son of God. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And the third one is the conscience of sinful man cannot endure a full revelation of the glory or character of God. Okay, remember we talked earlier about face being the full revelation and the, just seeing the back parts being only a partial revelation. That idea. So in other words, no man can see see my face, see me in my full glory and full understanding of my character and live because we're so opposite from that. But we'll go through each of these three possibilities and I hope it'll make a little more sense. So number one is examples of seeing God and living. There, there are some, okay? Uh, Genesis 32, 30, Dorothy. And Jacob called the name of the place Penile, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Okay, so according to what he said, he saw God face to face. Now, this was the Son of God, probably. Yeah, it's called the Angel of the Lord in the yeah. story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that word penial refers to the face of God or facing God. Okay, and you can say in that story, they had like a, a face off, I guess, because they were wrestling. They were wrestling. Yeah. Um, All right. <laughs> and the scene there, I have seen God, is the same original word as in Exodus 33, 20 here. There shall no man see me and live. Same original Greek word, which is good to know. Second possibility in our list was that you can't see my face etc., was a reference to the Father and not to the Son. And there's some verses that, you know, might suggest that. Uh, John 1, 18, Evans. No man had seen God of any kind, the only begotten Son, which is, the, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. Okay. This verse is pretty straightforward. I mean, obviously, I mean, this is Jesus himself speaking in the Gospel of John here. Um, I, I guess it's him speaking. No, it's, okay. it's the beginning of John. John is here. Yeah, yeah, okay. But um, obviously, Jesus was there, was seen by many, many people. And there's other places. Yeah, we see other places where he said, no man is seen by. So... Jesus was obviously seen. His father is the one being referred to as not being seen. Okay, so that could suggest that this Exodus thirty three twenty is referring to no man seeing the face of the father, as opposed to the son. Okay, John six forty six, uh, Judy. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the father. Okay, this is kind of similar. And that's Jesus' words. That's He's Jesus' words. I think. Yeah. Okay, and then First John four twelve. Oh. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. Okay, so this has the same. No man has seen God at any time, as in John one eighteen. So, what did Jesus mean when he said, uh, John fourteen nine, Trish? Jesus saith unto him. Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, shew us the Father? If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So my question is, what did Jesus mean when he said that? And I've put some thoughts in here, but I just wonder what you want to say first. I mean, you're not going to give us the answers. Not right away. <laughs> Any thoughts? What their characters know? are the same. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say is okay. their characters are the same. I mean, you've seen what I've been doing. I've been healing people and and uh, preaching the kingdom of God and showing love. And my father's just like that. 
Yeah. My father is like me. Yeah, that's sort of sound too. We we use that expression like father like son. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I can see a lot of my characteristics in my son. Okay, I put down uh, whatever you have seen of me, whatever you comprehend of my character, my father is the same, mm -hmm. which is basically what you said. And I've heard it explained like this from one source. But, yeah, um, the father is the source of all. And I put a little diagram here. The son is the channel through which God blesses and also the channel to approach the father. Okay, so we've got the father as the source and the son as the channel. And we can say that the father is the source of everything. And through the son, God blesses mankind and the angels. And we know that the Bible talks about the father creating, God created. Um, and this says all things were made by his son. So I, I've thought of it this way, that um, a person could be a movie producer. That's someone who has an idea has lots of money, has the right connections, but he doesn't know how to direct actors and cameras on a movie set. So he gets the whole thing going, the producer does, and then he hires a director. And the director is the one that produces the end result. Okay, so producer and director, the father is the source, the son is the channel. And it's interesting that the Son is not only the channel of the Father's blessings to us and all creation, but the Son is the channel for mankind to go the opposite direction and approach the Father. Mm -hmm. And this is brought out especially by John 14, 6. Dorothy. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay, thank you. So, of course, Jesus lived, you know, about 2,000 years ago. Does that mean those who died in Old Testament times had no chance to ever see the Father? No. Oh. Because Jesus has been there from the beginning as well. Right. Of course, we never saw the example of Jesus, or, or people in Old Testament times never saw that portrayal of Christ's and therefore his father's character while he lived on earth. Okay. But there's many times in the Old Testament when the angel of the Lord came and did something and we can kind of think that that might have been Christ. Right. Somehow. Right. Um, I'm going to suggest, and this would be another study which we won't go into, but he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. So it's 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 how the son acts. It's his principles of uh, putting others first. It's um, you know showing love to others. All those things. That's the way that he demonstrated. That's his way. And if we follow his way, then we can come to the father. We can come to the father. So a person could adopt those principles those other-centered, loving principles towards their neighbor, they could have done that before Jesus was on earth, is what I'm saying. Um, he shows the way, but those principles always existed before he um, came to earth, if that makes sense. So I would say that the way is not, it's him personally, but it also has to do with Christ-likeness of character. Being sub us being submissive, obedient, other centered, loving, not violent, all that sort of thing. Okay. Um, okay, still in regard to this father and son, source and channel, this is kind of interesting. Who does the son answer to? These verses will tell us something about that. John 8 29, Evans. And he that sent me with me, the Father had not left me alone. Why do always those things that please him? Okay, so he's doing things that please his father. We can say he's been obedient to his father. 
certainly while he was on earth, we understand he did not use, uh, Jesus did not use any of his own divine power to do things. He depended on his father. I believe his father would have directed him, you know, go here, say this, etc. Okay, and then John 4.34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Okay, to do the will of him that sent me. So that would imply obedience, you know, taking the direction from his father, etc. Uh, John 6.38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, same same idea there. And then one more, uh, Hebrews 10, 7, Trish. Then I said, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Okay, so they got the same idea there again. To do his father's will. So he was in complete submission and obedience to his father. And that is an example for us. Okay, so that's who does the son answer to? Now here's a similar question. Who does the father answer to? Nobody. Okay. Jesus says you, no. you might you might say that the, he answers to humanity because as a creator, you have to listen to your creation to see how it's going. Okay. Well, uh, that that's kind of simplifying it a bit, but there's everyone has someone they answer to. Yes. Where oh. and sometimes the one that seems at the top has to answer to the uh the people down below him. Okay. As and, and you can see that in the amount of questions that have been asked in the Bible of God, like why did you do this, God? Or, you know, and he might be just proving, using humans as proof for other, okay, this is going to get woo-woo, but, <laughs> you know, uh, for other planets or for other people not on the earth. Or, yeah. Okay, that might be getting a little too yeah. space, okay. <laughs> space case for you. <laughs> I, I like your thought, though, in a way, and I've got, I got about four things I put down here. I'll reveal them in a minute, but, yeah, there's a sense in which God made us, and therefore he's responsible. So in that sense, he's responsible for us. Like I, I think of this example sometimes that uh, many years ago, I used to keep aquariums quite a bit, because I was, of course, into fisheries and scuba diving and stuff like that. And, you know, a little aquarium, you're outside of it. You have total control over it. You could destroy the whole thing if you wanted. Um, I set that up, and I've got these little fish in there. I have some responsibility to care for them. Yeah. Okay, and that's a better way of putting my <laughs> disjointed <laughs> speech. <laughs> yeah, but I I get what you're saying. <clears throat> Trish, he's he answers to all of his creation, I guess, in the end, as to yeah. to justify his actions. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't have to in the sense that people couldn't do anything about it if he didn't answer to them, but he does. Well, it's like a a CEO of a company has to answer to the shareholders. Okay. Or or yeah. the rest of the company as to why well, you run in this company okay or not. Yeah. So that's why we're judging him. Yes. Yes, we're 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 gonna judge him. Mm -hmm. Okay, I put in here who does the father answer to? And these are just possibilities. So I put no one is one. There's no one above him that he answers to. But there's for instance in Job, um, there's a couple of verses where Satan came into this sounds like a heavenly council where all the sons of God were assembled. Um, so I think God has takes input from others as to how he runs his universe. Um, we also know from our recent study that God is very, very humble. Okay. He's not below taking advice from people or listening to their objections. Um, also, God, there's this principle of accommodation. Like God has many, many times accommodated the wishes of his people. And we did that in a study here uh, just recently, and I'll be doing it again while I'll be doing the humbleness, but accommodation very much comes into it. I'll be doing that next week. Um, 
Also, he's accountable to his own character. Can you say that? We know that God is love. That's the primary attribute of his character. And as such, he can't act outside of that. So we can say that he's responsible to, or almost you can say he answers to his own character. Mm -hmm. I will read Isaiah 14, 14, which says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Who was it that said that? Lucifer. Lucifer. Satan. Yes. Okay. Is heights of the clouds, going above the heights of the clouds, referring to going to the upper atmosphere? Yeah. Could clouds have another meaning? Yeah. What could that mean? Well, the angels. Yeah, yeah. The but... angels come in clouds yes. clouds of angels in fact i need to add that word to the glossary of the witnesses of the witnesses yeah but clouds are associated with god's throne even mm -hmm. and certainly clouds of angels so who was satan aspiring to be like the most high like god okay like, god. like the father himself okay yeah okay dorothy is there we just see her behind her great there Dorothy, you're behind oh. your veil. Yeshua himself is also the archangel, right? There's only one archangel. He's the head of the angels. When he was on earth, he was an angel? He never was an angel in the strictest sense of an angel. He is the archangel, which means the head of the angels. But I think in heaven, before he became incarnate on the earth, he was probably in the form of an angel, at least when he communicated with them. Because he was the head of the angels. And he was a messenger. And he was a messenger. When Satan says, um, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, he's saying he will be a more <laughs> exalted being, or how could you say it, than the angels. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is that he could be saying he will supersede the Son of God even. He will be like the Most High. Okay? Because mm -hmm. he is an angel. And he was an angel, yes. so he wants to be higher than he was, than yes. the position he was given. And his position was actually not simply any old angel, but he was um, the covering cherub. So let's look at the third in our list here. These are possibilities for the meaning of you can't see my face and live. And the third one, one was the conscience of sinful man cannot endure the full revelation of the glory or character of God. So as in the story of Moses seeing God's glory, man can understand to a degree, that's the important point here, to a degree the glory or character of God represented by God's back parts. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's not his face. It's not a full revelation of his character. It's a partial only revelation. But a full revelation of what God is like would be too painful to a guilty conscience. Okay, so even a person who's, say, in jail, they've committed all sorts of crimes, they may have, maybe they read the Bible in their youth or something. They have some understanding of God's character. Okay, he's supposed to be a nice guy, even though he tells the Israelites to kill all his people and everything, you know. They're messed up in their thinking, but they have some idea. Okay, Revelation 6, 16. Let's read that. Uh, Evans, please, is back. Okay, and say to the mountains and lucky locks, follow on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the light of the Lamb. Okay, thank you. So, this is a situation where people, the lost, are exposed to God's character, uh, the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And because, and we're talking the lost, so because their consciences are so guilty, they want to be hidden from this glory. In fact, it's so painful to them, their consciences, that they would rather have rocks and mountains fall on them, which would, of course, kill them. 
it's kind of strange, but it just shows how powerful an effect the conscience has. And notice that it makes a distinction between him that sitteth on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, so we are, we're to understand the Father and the Son. Okay, let's read Proverbs 25, 21 to 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Okay, what is happening there with these coals of fire? Yeah, it's not literal coals of fire. You are making him feel guilty. Okay, you're affecting, afflicting the conscience. Afflicting his conscience, that's right. So as we learn of him, and we're changed little by little to be more like him, we can comprehend and appreciate him more, and will therefore love him more as well, and become more like him. And that in turn will increase our capacity to understand what he's like. It's kind of a almost a vicious cycle where you know, we're changed and we become more like him and appreciate him and understand him more, and it just keeps going like that. Moses did not fully understand God's character, and that's shown by... This is early on, of course, though. He killed an Egyptian, right? Mm -hmm. um, at one point, he assumed God was going to wipe out all of Israel and start over. Uh, God was kind of testing him there, but that's what he understood. You can tell by his response. Uh, right near the end of his ministry, he struck the rock when he was told just to speak to it. And uh, God was not happy with that because it really affected um, the understanding of God in the eyes of the people. Okay. Um, that's a little bit about Moses. In Isaiah, there's a couple of interesting verses here. Isaiah 6, 1, Paul. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his glory filled the temple. Okay, we touched touched on this when we looked at um, the humility of God, if you remember. Um, just to refresh our minds, what did we say about the high and lifted up part? People lift him up. He doesn't lift himself up. Okay, good, good. Um, angels presumably lift him up. He doesn't lift himself up. And Paul, in the break there, you were telling me something about Exodus 40, 34, was it? Yeah. Yeah, do you, want to just, do you want to just read that while we're looking at this one here? His train filled the temple, it says, in Isaiah 6, 1. And Paul found another verse that kind of helps explain that. I should put it in here. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, filled the tabernacle. So you've got the glory of the Lord filled it, and in Isaiah you've got his train or the train of his robe i guess filled the temple the robe supplied yeah so it's it's basically equating the robe with the glory right mm -hmm. and that's interesting too because the bible in other places talks about the robe of righteousness and mm -hmm. similar things and we would understand that also to be character mm -hmm. okay so i gotta look at that Okay, so let's go to verse 5 of Isaiah 6. Uh, Trish, please. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I will dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of the hosts. Okay. So what we're looking at is this point about the conscience of sinful man cannot endure a full revelation of the character of God. And we saw that in Moses, he was only allowed to see God's back parts, and we know he had faults right till the end of his ministry. Um, Isaiah, of course, was a, a great prophet, and he saw, we don't know how much he saw, the Lord sitting upon his throne. Did he see his face? How much did he understand? We don't really know. But he said, woe is me. And he recognized that he was unclean. Okay? So he probably being unclean, did not 
get a full view of God's face or glory or character. Okay, that would help to explain this Exodus 33.20, right? Okay, so when we're talking full revelation, okay, that relates to this verse, 1 Corinthians 13.12, Dorothy. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Okay, so would it make sense that through a glass darkly is meaning a partial view, oh, yeah. an incomplete comprehension, something like that, mm -hmm. equals Moses seeing only the back parts, mm -hmm. okay, whatever that is. It's not a full revelation, a full face view, sort of. In, uh, in my booklet, The Lake of Fire and the Second Death, and I put a link here where a person could get it, it talks about that full revelation of God's character that I believe will happen to everyone in the lake of fire experience, okay, at the end of the millennium. And here's just a, I like this picture, it's, it's someone that's kind of really fearful or something, I don't know, it just kind of has that look to it. Um, so that that book, I think, explains it quite well, what is, what is happening there. Okay, but aren't we told to seek God's face? You know, it looks like up here, Exodus 33, 20, there's a danger. If you see too much of his face, you're going to die. And yet we're told to seek God's face. That seems like a bit of a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So let's read First Chronicles 16, 11, Evans. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Okay, it's kind of like we're uh, suggested we make a priority of seeking his face. Continually. Yeah, yeah, keep at it. Okay, and another one here, Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Okay, so again, the suggestion is that they should seek his face. And I just put in here kind of a little definitions almost of different ways face is used in Scripture. It's used for anger or wrath, properly understood. And for example, and we looked at that verse, I guess, uh, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Um, you know, the day of his wrath has come is the idea, and that's how people are comprehending him. Face is used for favor, as in Psalm 31, 16, make thy face to shine on thy servant. He's talking about favor. Face is used for perception. Um, how long wilt thou hide thy face from me? Psalm 13. Uh, seek the face is used to pray to or to seek the favor of. If you're seeking the face of God, that's what you're doing, usually. Uh, set the face against is used um, when there's opposition. Um, face to face is used to mean in the presence of. And one example is Acts 25, 16, where it's talking about both parties are present uh, as Paul and his accusers, and he'll have opportunity to answer for himself. So it's face to face. If you're just going to find that quickly. I'll get her to read it. Oh. Okay. To them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself. Okay, so Paul was being accused and he wanted an opportunity to defend himself, basically. Uh, face to face is used for clear, a clear understanding of a person. And that's, we read that verse a little bit ago. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. So with a clear understanding, which we don't have at this point, although we're gaining it little by little. So let's look at some of these verses about set my face against. Um, Leviticus 17.10, Paul. And whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood. 
and will cut him off from among his people. Okay. Trish, I wonder if you could read from the screen here the same verse, but it's the yep. Holman Christian Standard Bible. Okay. Anyone from the house of Israel or from the foreigners who live among them who eats any blood, I will turn against that person who eats blood and cut him off from his people. Okay. Um, so the turn against is kind of clarifying the set my face against, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But this whole thing needs to be understood correctly because it kind of sounds like cut off, we might understand, is to kill them even. But I would refer people to this link here for the word study we did on cutting him off. And it explains it there, I think, quite well. But one other verse here, Leviticus 20, verse 3, Dorothy. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he had given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Okay. So to cut him off, it turns out, really means to be separated from the covenant. And of course, anyone on, you know, repentance, turning their ways can, can be uh, reinstated, basically. Um, and this is just from a Dictionary of Idioms, uh, set your face against, to set one's face against something, to be strongly opposed to or disapproving of something. And they have an example here. My parents set their faces against me marrying her, so we eloped. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but also we're told to seek God's face. You, my people, we shall call them by my name, shall humble themselves and the blade and the seek my face and the turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Okay, so encouraged to seek God's face there. And Psalm 27, 8. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Okay, so he's saying, seek my face, and the psalmist is obedient, saying, obediently saying, yes, I will. Um, and then face to face, there's some verses about face to face, meaning in the presence of. 2 Corinthians 6, 16, Paul. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Okay. So we're quite familiar with these. It just has the suggestion that um, God wants to dwell with us. And if his dwelling with us, I will dwell in them, it says, then we're certainly in his presence. Right? Um, and of course, that's the way in which he can be present with everyone at once, no matter where they are. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3.16, Trish. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Okay, so much the same. There's a few verses that go together like that. Um, Colossians 1.27, Dorothy. To whom God would make known... What is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory? Okay. Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning? God with us. Yeah, God with us. Yeah. Okay, so if the, if the presence or visibility of the face of God... Um, comes to a person who is not healed, that, of course, is going to cause great fear. But it gives us hope of glory, actually, those that are sort of in tune with him. So we must be seeking the face <clears throat> of the right God. Okay? So I'm saying here, a God of, in our perception, if God is a God of punishment and destruction and revenge, it's the wrong God. Mm. And that image of God if we actually hold that in our minds, 
can only result in fear, even if subconsciously. And on the website, I've got that series called... Uh, you know, it's sad that Satan had that glory, but he wasn't happy with the glory he had. He wanted more than... He wanted more. Yep. Yep. There's a whole series of studies called Cleansing the Sanctuary series. Actually, 23 studies. We spent a long time years ago going through that. It talks about how how the mind is gradually changed. And it's, it's one of the later ones. Maybe this one, the completely clear conscience. And uh, there's two or three studies of being of two minds. We have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. And many people will recognize God is love, and they know the verses and everything, and they talk like that. But if you have a wrong concept of God, your subconscious mind is going to have thoughts, if you will. They're not even conscious to you, but they affect your whole outlook on life. If I don't measure up, God's going to kill me. You know, God, God punishes by burning people with fire, things like that, because in many situations that's what's taught um, incorrectly can i ask a question yes last sabbath you read a little thing from your website from somebody who was very afraid of god because they were afraid they were going to be destroyed by god yep. did you respond to that person and did they respond to your response actually um i gave that over to michael uh-huh I think I I responded, and I had told Michael about it, and then yeah I responded, told Michael about it, and he said, "Could I say something?" So I said, "Sure." So Michael responded to that person, mm -hmm. and they responded back, and they were very thankful, but they still had doubts. Mm -hmm. and I think Michael replied to them again, and uh, you know I've got a lot to do with this website, so I don't mind handing over little jobs I got to others, and Michael is happy to do that. Um, he might continue corresponding with this person to kind of encourage them and help them be less fearful of God, basically. Mm -hmm. That person was so afraid of God. Oh, yeah. And that was really good at writing stuff out. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I read what he wrote and I thought, well, that's excellent. Yeah, so yeah. It, yeah, he took some I just time. wondered how the, the person responded to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so if we have this wrong concept of God in our thinking, and many people do, even before they approach the Bible maybe, because everyone has some idea, when they start off seeking the face of God, seeking an understanding of him and his character, in a sense, they're seeing in their understanding the devil. And I say that meaning the devil has worked hard to portray God with his own attributes of character. Okay, um, the devil is God's enemy, and all his enemies do the character assassination things. They can't kill a person, right? And so many people have many wrong conceptions of God's character. And uh, that's what all this process is trying to help resolve. Okay, so I guess we're at the end of this. Um, any thoughts or questions? It'll be edited and uh, put on the website. The written part will, and the video will be edited as well a little bit. We need to seek his face. Yes, we need to seek his face. Mm -hmm. And eventually, we'll get to see his face and live yes, forever. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's hallelujah. the good part. Yeah, hallelujah, that's the good part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it says, let me just read this. And he said, Thou can, cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Let's say it like this. In your present state, when you have a right comprehension of me, the Father says, as shown by my Son on earth and in the Word, you will at some point be able to see me and live forever. Mm -hmm. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome.